Good morning. Really cool to have you all here. Um, if you saw the email I sent out yesterday morning, uh, I have had some changes to my schedule. And first of all, I want you to know I apologize for that. This is not how I like to run classes, but uh, sometimes life gets in the way and this is definitely one of the times. So I want to talk about those real fast. So today, everything's like normal and stuff. We'll talk about chapter two, part two, et cetera, et cetera. Friday, um, I'm going to have a normal lecture in this room at nine o'clock. All right. So I'll be here and stuff like that. That we're good. However, my office hours after that will be postponed, canceled, rescheduled. So one was this morning, one is Monday at eight o'clock. Uh, so I don't have office hours on Friday. And then at one o'clock, when you have lab, uh, Bernadette Harnish will be your substitute teacher. And honestly, she's really awesome. She's a really good friend and she's really warm and stuff. I think you'll really like her. She's taught Chem 221 before, so uh, it won't be a problem with the material. And with Bernadette then, uh, you'll go over problem set number two, like before, and then you'll turn it in, self-correct it, stuff like that. Quiz number two will follow. Uh, make sure you turn in the density lab, and then you'll talk about the nomenclature lab afterwards. So bring a printed copy, stuff like that. Um, Monday, back to business as usual, shouldn't be any big deal. And again, sorry about the confusion, that's kind of an unusual thing. Any questions on that. Is this going to be a permanent change or just? Oh, no, no, okay. just one day. So oh, just one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I, uh, that would be a more serious announcement. <laughs> this is a one day thing. Good call. Okay. No, just one day. Other questions? We left off on Monday talking about types of formulas. <clears throat> and this is what we're starting to get into is naming things. And naming things is really important. So for example, water and hydrogen peroxide have almost the same number of atoms. Water is H2O, oxygen has one additional oxygen. But the effect is quite different. Like we drink water all the time, and you should, but hydrogen peroxide, you don't want to be drinking that, man. That would like start to oxidize your throat and stuff like that would be pretty crazy. So we need to start thinking about ways to name them, which is where we're going. But for right now, what I wanted to do was also talk about a molecular formula versus an empirical formula. And molecular formula is like what the molecule looks like, all right? So water literally has two hydrogens and oxygen. Now, in reality, the atoms, as we'll see more in Chem 222 than we will right now, the oxygen is in the middle of the hydrogens. And we'll talk about how to interpret and figure these kind of things out more in Chem 222. But this is really what it is. So people will usually condense the atoms together. So instead of drawing HOH, they'll write H2O. This is the kind of thing we'll be focusing on in this next section. Hydrogen peroxide, on the other hand, then, would be H2O2. Now, what it looks like on the atomic level is the oxygens are in the middle and the hydrogens are on the outside. So these are just ways that give the chemist more idea about how the atoms fit together. In this section, though, we will talk about molecular formulas and empirical formulas. And an empirical formula is just the smallest whole number ratio of atoms in the formula. So if you look at hydrogen peroxide, two and two, if you divide both of those numbers by two, you get one H and one O, or an empirical formula of just HO. So hydrogen peroxide has an empirical formula of HO, hydrogen peroxide has an actual molecular formula of H2O2. Now you could take water down to say H1O.5, but we're gonna see in this section that chemists usually don't like using fractions. So in this case, you don't wanna go any lower than whole numbers. The empirical formula and molecular formula are the same. These are just other examples of different compounds. And again, you don't need to know the names or anything like that, but just kind of foreshadowing. And finally, I did want to show these two because they have the same molecular and empirical formulas, but the structural formula, how they're put together is different. Um, ethanol is actually drinking alcohol. Just say no, kids. Dimethyl ether is actually a gas. So the position of the atoms will make a big difference sometimes in what they do, all right? You would not want to sniff <laughs> dimethyl ether. That would be bad news. However, if you're 21 and over, uh, maybe on occasion, uh, ethanol is, is okay. 
Any question? Yeah. So, uh, does the structure change when it comes to the like? If it's like a, if it's, if it's like a solid, a uh, liquid or gas. Cool. The answer is no. Water is H2O, regardless if it's ice or liquid water or steam. Uh, the difference between the phases is how the water mo molecules interact. And that's something we'll look at more in Chem 222. But for right now, yeah, water is water, all right? So you swallow ice or you steam, <laughs> so it's okay. It's just H2O. But if you had, say, ice hydrogen peroxide or gaseous hydrogen peroxide, Mess you up, <laughs> so don't don't do it. Okay. Like, the reason I'm asking is like, like a, like vitamin E. If if it's consumed like through like a form like olive oil or something like that, it's safe to eat, consume. But when it turns into a vapor, it's like poisonous. So I was just wondering if the structure had to do with that. Well, you can drown in water, so sometimes the amount makes a difference, all right? Like what's around you, okay? Uh, if you were to do a molecule of hydrogen peroxide, that wouldn't hurt either and stuff. Um, I'm going to defer that until later, though. We need a few more tools to kind of build on that discussion, so. But I like where you're, what you're thinking, um, and uh, let's just get a few more chapters in before we tackle it. Good. Okay. Here's a quick question then to make sure you know this empirical molecular formula. And again, if you have the molecular formula, i.e. P4O10, and you want to find the empirical formula of this compound, smallest whole number ratio is what you're after. So if you divided 4 and 10 by 4, say, you'd have 1P and O2.5. Are fractions usually okay in chemistry? No. <laughs> All right, really. There's one time that I'll have to make you use fractions, and all the other times we're going to stay away from fractions. So no fractions. So instead of 1 to 2.5, if you divide those both by 2, you'll get P205. That would be the smallest whole number ratio of atoms. Is that cool? Any questions? Good. Okay. Um, allotropes are pretty important for us, and allotropes are different versions of the same element. Now, most of this chapter is on compounds, when you mix different atoms together. But allotropes kind of fall in this area because nobody knows what else to do with them. We talked, uh, I think on uh, Monday, how graphite and diamond are both versions of carbon. And there's also uh, other versions. So for example, buckyball, which is C60, 60 carbon atoms, or formerly Buckminster fullerene, that's another version of carbon. And if you hear about them making like space elevators to, like, that'll literally lift people from the ground up to some space station, a lot of times those space elevators, they wanna use something like graphene, which is another version of carbon. So these are all allotropes of carbon. They're all carbon, all right? But they're different forms, and they'll have, going along with what Patrick said, they'll have their own melting points and boiling points and their hardness scales and stuff like that. If you're using a pencil, you're using graphite. You wouldn't want to use a diamond for a pencil because it would rip through the paper. It's one of the strongest substances known. Uh, so all of these are kind of fun. Most elements, all right, just have one form. Most of them we consider to be monatomic, which means there's individual atoms. So for example, chromium, CR number 24, chromium usually is just an individual atom. You can think about it like that. Allotropes, for example, carbon and a couple other ones will be different forms. But there's also seven elements which aren't monatomic and they don't have different allotropes. And we'll talk about these diatomics here in a little bit. Now, <laughs> remembering that most elements on the periodic table are monatomic. They come as individual pieces. But these seven, which I've hidden in red right there, are actually diatomics. They come as twos. 
So this silly little expression, have no fear of ice clear brew, and by the way, there's other versions of this you can use, doesn't matter. These represent what's called, what are called the seven diatomics. And these seven always come in pairs. So if you have like helium, all right, helium comes as individual atoms, it's monatomic. Chromium comes as individual atoms, monatomic. But oxygen, iodine, chlorine, they always come with their twin, if you will. So we don't usually have individual oxygen atoms. You have oxygen as O2. What we're breathing right now is actually two oxygens at a time. And the nitrogen is also comes in pairs and stuff, bromine, blah, blah, blah. This is gonna start being really important to us. Now again, most atoms are individual pieces, individual atoms, monatomics. But these seven, man, they will appear quite often as these diatomics. Um, Hunkel Griff is another expression sometimes people use to know these seven. But you can see that this is going to be important to you coming up. Now, have no fear of ice. Clear brew works for me, but I'm weird. Hunkel Griff, and there's, there's other versions out there to remember. Um, there are some other elements that exist as more than one version. So for example, phosphorus, we talked about uh, in the last chapter, phosphorus can be P4, and it also comes in these wild long chains. Oxygen also has an allotrope, which is ozone. So ozone O3 is another version of oxygen. Sulfur is another one that comes as SA. But again, for us here in Chem 221, you can essentially assume that all the elements come as individual pieces except for those seven diatomics. If you know about phosphorus and you know about sulfur, cool. But honestly, I don't care about those as much. I do want you to know that have no fear of ice clear brews. Those will be important when we start figuring out amounts added in, stuff like that. Now, when it comes to making molecules stick together, there's actually two kinds of glue that make molecules stronger or weaker. And we're gonna talk about the stronger one first, which is when you have ionics coming, ions coming together. If you haven't heard ion before, an ion is just an atom that either has too many electrons or not enough electrons. Here's some examples down here. Sodium has 11 protons. And if you remember on the periodic table, the blue numbers are the atomic numbers, and those are the number of protons. So if you have an equal number of positive protons and a negative electrons, Sodium, the elemental form, will be neutral. You won't have any extra positives or negatives. But if you take away an electron from sodium, now you have 11 positive protons and 10 negative electrons. This electron has gone elsewhere. So if you want, you can actually do the math. 11 protons, positive one and 10 electrons, negative one, 11 minus 10, positive one, all right? So this is going to be a positive sodium ion, and we'll see, we're gonna call it cation here in a little bit. So notice the upper right corner now is gonna represent the charge on the ion, if there is one. So in this case, this would be a positive sodium ion. Now, electrons have to go somewhere, and electrons a lot of times like to go to the nonmetals, like chlorine. Now, chlorine on the periodic table is number 17. So 17, if it was a neutral chlorine, would have equal positive protons and negative electrons. However, if you add an electron, now you've got 18 electrons and 17 protons. So again, you can do the math if you want, 17 positive protons, and now an extra electron, so 18 electrons, negative. So this would be a chlorine ion, a negative ion, which we'll see here in a little bit, is called an anion. 
So see how the upper right corner represents then these positive or negative charges on the systems. If you take away an electron or electrons, you make what's called a cation. If you call it cation, it's okay. Uh, technically, it's cation, and I'll give you a better way to remember that here in a little bit. And usually, the electrons will go to nonmetals. So if you add an electron to an atom, it creates what's called an anion, a negatively charged ion. Notice how, for a symbol, like if you had sodium, the lower left number is the atomic number, number of protons. The upper left number is the mass number for the isotope. So for example, sodium is mostly uh, sodium-23. You don't have to know that, but let's assume that we're dealing with a sodium-23. On the other hand, the upper right corner is where the charge goes. By the way, you can write positive one. You could write it just positive. You could go one positive. It doesn't matter to me. And then if you had more than one atom in a compound, you would put that number down there. So for example, sodium carbonate is a compound we'll talk about. That's where the T would go. So every quadrant around the element symbol has like a meter in chemistry. Now if cation is not a term that's really useful for you or you haven't heard it before, all right, remembering that I am kind of a cat person at heart, all right, and I like dogs too, don't get me wrong, but cats have paws, all right? Meow. And so cat ions are positively charged ions, all right? So there's lots of what they call the chemistry cat memes out there, and that's what it comes down to. They're trying to show how the chemistry cat has a positive charge. What is that? Whoops. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go that fast about that. So cations are positive. I don't have a cool expression for anions are negative. Any questions on any of this? Sweet. When a magnesium atom loses two electrons, it becomes a cation. So this is an example of magnesium. And magnesium went from 12 protons and 12 electrons to a magnesium two plus ion. You still have the same number of protons. You change that number and you change the element. So for example, if you added a proton, it would become aluminum number 13. You took away a proton, it would become sodium number 11. But here now, we only have 10 electrons. So that's why it's a positive two, like positive 12 minus 10, if you will. That's where the positive two comes from. And we're gonna see that a lot of times magnesium has a positive two charge on it. Fluorine becomes an anion when it gains one electron. So fluorine has nine protons and nine electrons in the neutral state. When it gains an electron, which we'll see it does quite often, then it has 10 electrons. So doing the same kind of thing, you could say 10 times negative one plus nine times positive one that's where that negative one charge comes from. And again, you can write it as just minus, like I did right there. You could go minus one, one minus, all of these things are totally fine. So the next thing we'll look at then is why some uh, elements make positive cations, why some elements make negative ions, negative anions, and how to predict like what the charges are gonna be. Now, when you look at the entire periodic table, all right, there are two types of metals when it comes to charges. Some of them, we know their charges all the time, and we're gonna call those fixed charge metals. <clears throat> fixed charge metals are nice, because someone from Chem 104 says, oh, what's the charge on aluminum? Well, because I know it's a fixed charge metal, I can say, oh, well, aluminum's almost always plus three, and I sound so professorial, professor, or whatever. I sound cool, <laughs> all right? And you can too, all right? So when it comes to the periodic table, this group, group 1A, this group, group 2A, and what I'm gonna call the stairs have fixed charge. Now the stairs are aluminum, gallium, indium, that's the highest step, then zinc and cadmium, the next step, and silver is the other one. 
See, if you use your imagination, it's like you take the first step to silver, the second step on top of zinc, and the third step on top of aluminum. This is a, maybe a better way to say it. The stairs um, have positive one for silver. The second step, zinc and cadmium are always positive two. And the third step, aluminum, gallium, indium, always positive three, which is really nice. Uh, groups 1A and group 2A, their charge is just equal to the group number. So earlier I showed you a sodium losing one electron. Sodium is positive one because it's in group 1A. And everything in this, in this uh, column, with the possible exception of hydrogen, we'll talk about that later, but most of these things, even hydrogen, will be plus one. Lithium to francium, always plus one. All right, hydrogen mostly plus one. And you can do a similar thing for group 2A because they're in group two. Calcium, almost always plus two. Barium, almost always plus two. So if you're ever curious about strontium, named after some place in Scotland, if I remember right, strontium is a positive two, just because it's in that particular place. So there's a lot of metals on the periodic table. This is the metalloid line, metals to the left of that line, all right? The ones where we know their charge all the time, group 1A, group 2A, and these stairs over there. And that's really empowering as a scientist because you can have, say, aluminum blue and you don't know what it is. You know, some student tells you about vitamin E going into the gas phase or whatever. You know, I don't know, but there's a lot of things out there I don't know too. I'll be totally honest. However, if I hear aluminum blah, 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 <clears throat> probably the aluminum's going to be positive three, and then whatever else is with it, we can figure out will be some negative three kind of combination. Now, all the other metals on the periodic table, and there are a lot of them. For example, almost all of the B element metals, except for zinc, cadmium, and silver, uh, almost, there's a couple metals under the metalloid lines, and the lanthanides and actinides. All of those metals are what we call variable charge metals. And someone from Chem 104 says, I have some iron, blah, blah, and I don't know what the blah, blah is, and I want to know what the charge is on iron. Okay, I don't know either. <laughs> I'll be totally honest. If I don't know what else is with the iron, I won't be able to tell. Now, mostly iron is positive 2 and positive 3, but there's also positive 6 and a positive 5, once in a while positive 1. Even I, with my PhD, don't know what the charge on the iron is going to be unless you include some way to tell. So these variable charge metals will always have a Roman number with them. So if you see iron Roman numeral two, that two means it's a positive two iron. And if you see a vanadium Roman numeral three, that means that vanadium is gonna have a positive three charge. So if you start doing some kind of uh, work with uranium, number 92, uranium is not 1A, 2A, and it's not one of the stairs. So you're going to need a Roman numeral with it too. So uranium is often positive 4, but there is some positive 2 and positive 3 I've seen. You would have to put that with your uranium so other scientists could know which version you're using. There's an older way of naming variable charge metals, <clears throat> and it uses like things like ferrous and ferric or cupric and cuprous. Do not use that in my class. I will mark you down. <laughs> I do not like that. It is old school. Roman numerals are the way to go, all right? Ferrous and ferric is a relative scale. <clears throat> You'll deal with that when it comes to acids coming up, and that's bad enough, but <clears throat> with metals, it's really, really bad. So what we're seeing here is how scientists describe the positive charge on a metal. Metals almost always are positively charged. Some of the metals, we know what their charge is all the time, which is basically the stairs and groups 1A and 2A. But all of the other metals, if you're going to do it right, you've got to put a Roman numeral with it because even the hippest, you know, Nobel Prize winning chemists won't know what iron you have unless you have a Roman numeral associated with it.
All right. So let's see if we can find what the probable charge is on a barium ion. Now, Z of 56 is the atomic number. So if you look on the periodic table, 56 is right here, all right? Now, at 56, if we, instead of barium, if we would have asked about hafnium, which is right here, no clue. Hafnium is one of the variable charge metals. But barium is in group 2A, and that's one of the ones that we know they're charged all the time. So what should be the charge of something in group 2A? 2. Positive 2. Well done. That's right. All those group 2As, positive 2. Same thing for group 1A right next door. They're always positive 1, and those stairs are also ones that are set up. So. Any questions? The stairs are kind of funky. Uh, I'm kind of highlighting them here once again. Uh, first step, positive one. Second step, positive two. Third step, positive three. All right. So you can think about it going up the stairs or down the stairs. But again, this step with only one element is positive one, et cetera, et cetera. And these are ones that are very fixed charge. All right. So when gallium, for example, uh, makes a compound, it always loses three electrons to become positive three. Now it's not that you couldn't have gallium plus two or gallium plus one, it's just it's not very stable in those configurations. You'd have to use like vacuums and, and heat and stuff to make it happen. The normal version of gallium by far is a positive three ion. So if you're digging around in the earth and you find a gallium deposit, chances are it'll be some kind of gallium positive three compound. Now, the non-metals are the negative version of the positive metals. And non-metals, fortunately, do have fixed charges as well. Now, the non-metals, again, everything above that metalloid line that we talked about earlier. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, etc., and all the way down. Uh, Non-metals, when you want to know their charge, it's usually equal to the group number minus eight. Now, I'm assuming that you're using our quote-unquote version that I'd like you to use, which is A groups. So that means that fluorine, chlorine, bromine is group 7A, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, 6A, et cetera, et cetera. On the webelements.com website, for example, this is listed as 17, and this is 16. I don't encourage you to use that version, but you can if you want. You would just go 18, or group number minus 18. So if this is group 17, 17 minus 18, negative 1, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to assume you're using the group that I'd like you to use, the A groups. So 5 minus 8, nitrogen is going to have a negative 3 charge. And oxygen in group 6 would be 6 minus 8, oxygen's going to have a negative 2 charge. It's really important for scientists, as we'll see, to know what the negative side of a compound is. So notice how all of these names have been changed to an IDE ending. So oxygen became oxide, and chlorine became chloride, and carbon became carbide, all right? If you see the IDE ending, that means you're not dealing with regular fluorine, you're dealing with fluoride, the negative one version. And if you see sulfide, that means you've got the S minus two, you're not dealing with sulfur by itself. Um, fluorine, when it's by itself, is the diatomic, the F2, all right? But fluoride, the negative one version, is always by itself. So if someone said to you, hmm, what is the probable charge on arsenic? We'll assume it's a non-metal, even though it's right on the metalloid line. Well, arsenic is in group 5A, so 5 minus 8 would be negative 3. And most of the time, when arsenic is in a compound, it's going to have a negative 3, and we would call it arsenide. Just what you wanted to know. Hmm. Let's think about what the charge is going to be on a phosphide ion. Now, phosphide is not on the periodic table, but phosphorus is. 
So when you take a phosphorus atom and you make it a negative ion, all right, that's when phosphide pops out. What do you think the most likely charge will be on a phosphorus in group five? Negative three. Negative three, well done Clifford. So negative three is what you'd expect. Phosphorus is in group five, and group number minus eight, five minus eight, is how you figure out negative three. You change phosphorus to phosphide, P minus three, or three minus, either way is cool. Nice job. Any questions? So now you've kind of got an idea how to do the positive charges, and you've kind of got an idea of how to do the negative charges. When you're making a compound, all right, it's really nice to have an equal number of positives and negatives, all right? And that's kind of what we're going to go into next, is how you can figure these things out. This is just kind of an overview. Um, Groups 1A, 2A in the stairs are fixed charge metals, so we always know what their charge are, knock on wood. The charge is positive, the magnitude is group number almost all the time. The nonmetals, 5A, 6A, 7A, charge is negative, group number minus 8. The other medicals will use the Roman numerals to tell what the charge are. And again, you can tell me you've got titanium blah, blah, and I won't know either what the titanium's charge is unless you put that Roman numeral there. So it's very, very important. Oh yes, okay. <clears throat> now, in addition to the non-metals becoming negative ions, there's also a whole series of these things called polyatomic ions. And polyatomic ions, uh, if you break the name down, poly is many, many atomed ions. So this list here is basically a combination of atoms coming together and the whole thing has an ionic charge. Polyatomic ions are amazingly common and uh, one that's super common in our area is the nitrate ion. Nitrate ion is the result of animal waste. So if you've ever had a cow or a pig or something like that, and you know you don't reuse their stuff in your garden that they excrete, uh, this kind of stuff can be a real problem. It builds up and high levels of nitrates can be bad for your water and stuff like that. Polyatomic ions, are very weird when you're starting to learn how to name things. And I have a couple of tricks I will absolutely share with you, but in some ways, you kind of just got to start figuring these out for yourself. All right, memorizing. Now, starting with next week's quiz, if you wish to bring a page of notes with you, you can write these kind of things down and that's totally fine. In the old days, I had people memorize and they were always using cards and stuff like that to memorize them. But this year, what I'm gonna try, starting with next week's quiz and on midterms and stuff, you can use a page of notes. And if you want to write all of the polyatomic ions down on paper and bring that with you, that's awesome. However, I do want the notes to be handwritten, so no copying and pasting and printing, all right? That defeats the purpose. I want you to handwrite it. And the second thing is that I want you to turn in your page of notes with the thing you're taking. So like turn it in with a quiz, turn it in with a midterm, stuff like that. So I'm trying to take a little bit of the blunt, brunt off of memorizing all these crazy things. I will tell you lots of different ways to help you memorize, but wow, these are important. And they kind of come out of nowhere sometimes. Like you'll be thinking, of, you'll be looking on the periodic table for like a phosphate and you'll see phosphorus. Oh yeah, uh, phosphate is actually a little bit different than phosphide. So just FYI, this can be a funky part about learning this stuff. It's all stuff you can do. We'll go through uh, lots of these in the lab this week on Friday. Well, you'll do it with Bernadette, sorry I won't be there, but same idea and stuff. It's just there to give you some experience with how these can handle. Uh, this is a more thorough list, and again, there's quite a few of them. You should look in the nomenclature lab for our official CHEM 221 list. But one thing I wanted to point out right away, 
First of all, notice how most of these combinations of atoms are negative, all right? There's a lot more negative polyatomic ions than there are positive ones. There is one positive one, though, that's really important, and that's ammonium. And ammonia is kind of like ammonium. They are technically different, though. Ammonia with an extra hydrogen makes ammonium. So realize that if you have to guess, most of them are negative, but ammonium is important and it's positive. And the other thing I want to point out is that if the ion has an A-T-E or an I-T-E ending, that means it's going to have oxygen. Uh, we saw on Monday how both carbon and oxygen are very <clears throat> social. They like to bond with other pieces. So I'll throw some names at you, some names that might be kind of strange. But if the name has an A-T-E or an I-T-E, that means at the very least it's going to have oxygen in it. So those are some hints to kind of get you started and stuff. Um, most of the polyatomic ions will have as a central atom one of the nonmetals. So here's a series of chlorines. There's also a series of bromines, for example. Here's ones based on oxygen as well. Some of them have metals in them. Most of them are nonmetals. Some of them you may have heard of. So for example, cyanide is nasty. <laughs> and uh, nitrate I just was babbling about. Sulfates are a lot of times in um, uh, different kinds. Of sulfites, excuse me, are in wine sometimes as a preservative. Any questions so far? Okay. So <clears throat> of these polyatomic ions, which one do you think probably does not have oxygen? And if you look at these names, maybe you know them, maybe you don't. But what you can do right now is look at the ending. And if the ending has an A-T-E or an I-T-E, that means it's definitely going to have oxygen to it. So of these polyatomics, the only one, of course, that doesn't have A-T-E and I-T-E is cyanide. And so that would be the one that you would definitely say probably doesn't have oxygen. Now, this isn't always the case, like hydroxide has an ID ending, but it does have oxygen. So it's, it's a little complicated sometimes. But if you have to make a guess, and that's where I'm going with this, yeah, most of the time the IDEs won't, but the ATEs and ITs always will, to the best of my knowledge. So at this point, I should introduce you to my friend, Nick. And Nick is a camel. And Nick, unlike his vegetarian friend here, uh, apparently eats seafood, fine, whatever. Nick the camel brat, he's kind of a brat. Nick the camel brat ate icky clam for supper in Phoenix. And you're like, okay, Russell, it's time for you to go to the uh, place where they'll have some nice rest and stuff. But anyway, this is actually an acronym that can help you quite a bit with polyatomics. Now, this is an optional thing to do, but some students have really benefited from this Nick the Camel Brat expression. And I have a handout all about it. <clears throat> Notice the underlined words up there. Nick Camel Brat Icky Clam Supper Phoenix. <laughs> all right. So first of all, you can count the number of consonants and the number of vowels. Now, if it's been a while since you've had a class like this, vowels are A, E, I, O, and U, sometimes Y. And all the other letters of the alphabet are consonants. So Nick, N, C, K, those are all consonants. I is one of the vowels. So it has one vowel and three consonants. The consonants will actually tell you how many oxygens there are. So Nick has three consonants, three oxygens, and the N, Nick, is nitrogen. So for nitrate, which is where we're going with this, nitrogen is from Nick, three consonants is oxygen, and the number of vowels is the charge on the crazy thing. So there's one vowel minus one. Now, camel has two vowels, A and E, and three consonants. So if you figure out what camel is, which is based on carbon, then it would have one carbon, camel. It would have three oxygens, because it has three consonants, and two vowels means minus two. 
So this is something that sometimes people really dig, and you don't have to use this, all right? It's just a tool for you that some people have, have, have really liked. Um, if you want to really extend it, sometimes they can eat crepes, <laughs> all right? And uh, crepes is for chromate, but I don't know. That's kind of going a little crazy here with it. Anyway, I'm only putting this up here because some people have used it. If this works for you, awesome. If you think it sucks, don't use it. I'm not going to be worried about it. I'm not going to ask you questions on what icky stands for. <laughs> and, uh, I'm cracking myself up. Anyway, uh, it's just something that sometimes will help people to do it. All of these polyatomic ions here are the common version, and that'll be important to us here in a little bit too. And notice that all of these have A-T-E endings. That's what will be important for us here in a second, too. Uh, any questions on Nick the count? Now, <clears throat> acids uh, actually can stem from these polyatomic ions. Now, nitrate we saw was NO3 minus 1. Acids in a nutshell, all right, acids in a nutshell have an H plus associated with them. Acids get their bang from H plus. We're going to talk more about acids in chapter four, part two, in a future chapter. But for right now, realize how if you add an H plus to nitrate, you're going to make HNO3. And that's nitric acid, one of the strongest acids known. On the other hand, if you take that acid away, you react the nitric acid with something, the H plus goes away, and you're going to be left with nitrate. So we're going to see that acids and polyatomic ions sometimes go together. Like you'll add an H plus to the polyatomic acid, a polyatomic ion, excuse me, to make the acid. And if the acid reacts, which means taking away the H plus, you'll have the polyatomic ion left. One of the most common polyatomic ions, like I said, is nitrate, and potassium nitrate is somewhat common. Is there only some way we could contact you? Yes, indeed, Doctor. If only there were. Notice the substance encrusting that rock. Yes. Unless I'm mistaken, it's potassium nitrate. So, perhaps not the doctor. Perhaps everything. <laughs> if uh, you don't have to like Star Trek to do well in this class, I want to make that very clear. However, this is original Star Trek. That's the first version of the Gorn uh, in uh, Star Trek Enterprise, uh, the newest Star Trek, uh, the Gorn are coming back and stuff. But anyway, in this version, uh, he was able to use potassium nitrate plus some sulfur and some diamonds to make like a type of a gunpowder. All right, move on. But anyway, you'll see this kind of stuff in the real world. There's lots of uses for nitrates. Now, <clears throat> another one I want to talk about here real briefly is ammonium. And ammonium, NH4+, plus, is different than ammonia, NH3, all right? NH3 is a neutral compound. And what happens with ammonia a lot of times is people will add ammonia, which is a gas at room temperature, to water. And that makes ammonium hydroxide. And ammonium hydroxide has the ammonium in it, and a hydroxide gets kicked out. <clears throat> This is a real common cleaner in our houses. So if you've ever used like Windex and stuff like that, it's just basically an ammonia slash ammonium thing. But ammonia plus the H plus acid makes ammonium. And uh, you can go back and forth that way. So ammonium is one of the few positive polyatomic ions, one of the few cations, positive ions that are out there. Most of these polyatomics are negative, but ammonium is one that's positive and it's pretty important. There are other positive polyatomic ions that we'll run into later, but this is the most important one, I would argue. Um, phosphate, sulfate, acetate, you may have heard some of these terms before. Uh, sulfite is another one. Notice here sulfate to sulfite, all right? This is another common pattern you're going to see with polyatomics. You're going from a sulfur to a sulfur, same charge, but you lose an oxygen. And if you see this pattern, your ATE goes to an ITE. 
So in this case, sulfate went to sulfite by losing an oxygen. Same central atom, same charge, just one less oxygen. Oxygen, like I said, is super social and it can bounce back and forth like this. There's also nitrate to nitrite. You're losing an oxygen, you go from an ATE to an ITE. So down here is an example of how you can go even farther with chlorine. Now there's always the common ion, common version. That's what that Nick the Camel thing was all about. They'll always have an ATE. If you lose one oxygen, you make it ITE, so chlorite. You can even sometimes lose two oxygens, make it hypochlorite, hypo and ite. And if you add an oxygen to the common one, then you can even make perchlorate, which is extra oxygen on top of it. But again, same central atom chlorine, same charge, they're all minus one, it's just the number of oxygens change. All right, we'll do more of this on Friday. Have a great day. I'll see you on Friday.